a world governed by the whims of the gods, surrounded by a raging sea and filled with restless undead. Let's see with the wonders and horrors that await for us in Mythic Odysseys of Theros. Hi everyone, Jake from Monsters and Munchkins here, and today we are going to be talking about the new D&D campaign sourcebook, Mythic Odysseys of Theros. My first ever character was a Triton, and I got into gaming through Magic the Gathering, so I was very excited when this book was announced to see what it had in store for us. And it has a ton of player options and DM options. I'm not going to cover the player options in this video. Let me know if you'd like me to in the future. Instead, we are going to be focusing on the options that are given to us for interactions with deities and the very, very cool monsters that are packed into this book. And at the end, we will be talking about the basics of what I would do to make a fun mythic encounter. And one of my favorite parts about this book is how easy it makes it for us to make Theros adventures and Theros adventures related to the gods without the gods will overpowering player agency. That's always a difficult thing to do. In my Rod of the Seven Parts campaign, the gods interfering with PCs was something I tried to keep out of the way until they got to higher levels when the PCs could kind of work with them. So the PCs always felt like they were the ones making the choices from the very beginning. In here, it gives you plenty of options for that and options for communication, which is always a little bit tricky to pull off. It talks about just showing omens and wheel and woe, such as the augury spell and some other options for the augury spell, which is one of my favorite spells because it gives the DM a chance to just interact directly with the PCs through a third party medium and for commune and stuff like that and how to dive in deeper than just wheel or woe and just really let the players interpret that. And that's something that I think is really cool. Also, this interacts with monsters, which we will look at when we design our mythic encounter. Now, it also talks here about divination and dreams and visions and how to interject that into PCs. Anybody that's watched the second season of Critical Role, I'm sure wants to give their players plenty of dreams. And if you want to be somewhat original with it, maybe read through some of the very cool ideas in this book. It also talks about divine intervention here a bit and sending out emissaries to commune with them and how the gods will actually just go about interacting with the PCs. Now, looking at the monsters in Theros, there are a ton of cool monsters in here and you don't have time to touch on all of them. But let's just talk about some of my favorites really fast. Starting off with the hoplites, nothing incredibly cool here. I was just happy that they included hoplites because you know, Greece. Then they do some of their own takes on giants. As we talked about in the last video on the channel, I think giants are already one of the best bad guys out there. So whenever you can make those fights just a little bit more interesting, you have basically one of the best things for your players to be fighting in my humble opinion. Now the hundred handed one is just a really cool giant with a bunch of arms and it has a parry ability similar to like bandit captains. And there is the Doomwake giant as well, which is straight up evil. So your PCs don't have to feel bad about killing it. And it has a really cool Noxious Gust ability, which is a line um, 10 feet wide, 60 feet long, DC 18 con save, where they take 88 necrotic damage and are knocked prone. Well, it's nothing crazy new or anything like that. It makes the fight just a little bit more interesting. Whenever we can do that and throw something slightly different at our PCs, I always just enjoy that. Let's talk about the Cerebi. Now the Cerebi are like Cerebus, if you are a fan of Greek mythology, I certainly was when I was a kid. And these are two-headed or multi-headed dog creatures that patrol the banks of the underworld. They've got a bunch of cool abilities such as pack tactics and they have a breath weapon, which is different than your normal things like this. And it just makes for interesting underworld encounters that your PCs won't see outside of Theros. Talking about Theros would not be complete if we did not talk about the returned. Now, these aren't anything particularly special, but you should know about them before starting a Theros campaign. They are the Theros specific type of undead. They have a lot of very cool story and they offer you some slightly different options for undead, such as having a ranged attack and getting pack tactics. I love undead, so whenever they make undead in a book, I'm all about it. Now, we're going to move on in a second to the traditional monsters and implementing them in Theros, and then we're going to look at making one of those into a mythic encounter. But before we go back and look at those, let's talk about the mythic monsters from the book. Now, the first of them is this beauty, Arasta. I'm sure you've seen her pictures on the internet when the book was announced, and she is just absolutely terrifying. A satyr who was previously a chosen one of the gods, fallen from grace, and transformed into that beautiful thing. Now, she's got a bunch of legendary abilities that make her just a really fun monster to fight and something I personally would love to run in the future. However, she is a mythic encounter. So if you ever played a video game where you've defeated a boss and then it just gets back up and mutates into something else. I know when I was little, I loved playing House of the... House of the House of the Living Dead on the Wii and the bosses used to do that all the time and it made for really fun fights that would sometimes catch you by surprise because you never knew exactly what was going to happen and that's the same thing here so when she is destroyed you get to read the following text 
The nightmarish arachnid unleashes a shriek that sounds like a thousand spider carapaces scarring slate. In response, the ground ripples and bursts over the monster, revealing itself as a wave of countless spiders, arachnophobes, I'm sorry. The tiny arachnids swarm the larger horror, girding it in skittering bodies. This makes her CR 21, and then when she comes back, she regains 200 hit points, and her children grant her 100 temporary hit points, bringing her back up. Now, I think this is really cool, because at this point, your PCs have probably already shot their high-level spells at her and are pretty worn down. Or maybe they got lucky and they're not. But hopefully they're a little bit worn down at this point and they need to look for alternatives to win this fight. Now, I remember I was talking about in my last video about how a PC had to use a torch to fight a shadow, and I just love seeing my players come up with creative solutions like that. So if that's what Mythic Encounters bring on, and that's what I hope they bring on, I can't wait to see more stuff like this in the game, especially considering my favorite tiers of play tend to be tiers 3 and tier 4. Next up, we have Hythonia the Cruel. Now, she is the Theros Medusa. We'll cover the monsters, the traditional monsters, in just a moment. But she got some different abilities, similar to the Marlith. She got, like, a Constrict Attack and some other yuanti like things, which I think more Medusa should have, because they're already a cool bad guy and make PCs make interesting choices with having to avert their eyes, get disadvantage on attack rolls, all of that fun stuff. You can't target her with Line of Sight abilities. And if you're looking away, you just have to think, do I value myself or do I value dealing damage? We all know what the Barbarian is going to choose but it'll be interesting to see what the rest of the party decides to do and how they try to help each other out. Now, when she is slain, you get to read the following. I'm, again, if you're afraid of snakes, then I'm sorry. The Medusa's skin cracks, turns a lifeless gray, and shatters. The monster crumbles to dust, but what clatters to the ground isn't scale and bone, but hollow stone. Super cool, Medusa clattering to the ground, hollow stone, very nice. The sound of ripping coils precedes the Medusa rising up anew. The last of her head skin drops, shed skin drops away, revealing glistening, unscarred scales. I love that reading because, first of all, the whole stone and ashes to ashes thing with the Medusa is a very cool image, and it really gives the idea of a snake like shedding its old skin and being reborn. Also, it says she appears unharmed, so hopefully that messes with your PC's heads a little bit. Last but not least, we have Trimocratus, a kraken, a legendary Greek monster, and one that is sure to provide a very exciting and possibly deadly fight. Now, in addition to the other Kraken abilities he has, for some reason he's missing a lightning ability, which makes me super sad because Krakens and lightning and that stuff is cool. He's got coral growth, which is awesome, but no lightning. That's whatever. I'm going to give him lightning. When Traumacratus is slain, you get to read the following. The Titanic monster's carapace cracks, revealing a pulsing red-purple heart buried amid heaps of blubber and muscle. Fissures run across the beast's ancient cell, revealing three other mighty Ickerslick organs. The sea terror thrashes, channeling pain into fury. I love Krakens. Kraken. And the idea of a Kraken coming back with these very specific points that the PCs have to hit to kill him again is really cool for me. Remember to be giving those hearts bonuses to their AC from three quarters cover and stuff like that if the PCs can't position to fully see them. The hearts themselves have an AC of 22, so they're already hard to hit, so you can kind of up the difficulty here. Consider having a plus zero to all saving throws, so giving them the cover in my mind would kind of balance out the fact that they're just going to get wasted by saving throw spells. So really fast, we're just going to take a look at some of the traditional monsters from Theros. Now I'm just going to pick up my favorite ones. We're going to start with the Night Hag. The Night Hags here are like these creepy evil oracles who make bargains with PCs. So if you want to include something like that in the campaign, I'd make sure it's like a long running plot arc where the Night Hag is messing with the PCs through dreams and bargains and really kind of playing this elusive shadow game that messes with their heads. We've also got Sphinxes in Theros and not much to say here other than my favorite part of this is that they give us riddles, which is always useful. The Medusas here, they give us some different abilities. They give us a Constrict ability like we talked about previously and with her multi-attack, she can make one Constrict and one Short Sword and one with its Snake Hair rather than the usual Snake Hair Short Sword, short sword to give you some different options when running a fight. Options are always good and they will make things more interesting. Finally, we're going to talk about dragons. Now, dragons and Theros are often revered and brought sacrifices and flattery. They sometimes interact with the gods themselves. We're specifically are going to make a red dragon into our mythic encounter. Now, this red dragon, they're worshipped by a Crowans, which are a type of people. They have a Crowan hoplite too, I do believe, which will bring the red dragon things and kind of work as minions outside the lair and maybe just make that fight a little bit more interesting for your PCs. Now we are going to go back to chapter four of the book and roll on the random tables for the gods and see what we get. So I've got this D100 here. Let's see what I roll. That's a one. I got a one. I should be a cleric. One is an omen of Atheros. Faintly glowing wisps of fog or mist coalesce into shapes in the air. So Atheros is not a particularly great guy. He is the god of death. And from what I know, not the nice god of death. He's not like Hades, but he's like a bad guy. He's sending this dragon, these images of mist, Cool, so we've got a bad guy dragon working for the god of death. We're already off to a good start. Now let's go 
to the Nyxborn section of the book and roll for a Nyxborn trait. We got a six this time. So this dragon is made out of nightmares. Now that's really cool and that makes me really happy. Maybe it's one of your PC's nightmares that the dragon is made out of. This creature of Atheros maybe has some of the loved one's souls of the PC's captured and is using it to manipulate them. Maybe you can even intertwine a night tag into the plot somewhere to get all the Theros bad guys working together in the name of Atheros. Now let's roll for a Nyxborn statistics to see what the dragon's going to be doing in the fight. Three, immutable form. So it can't be polymorphed. That's cool, no polymorph things because this thing is not really real. It's made out of your PC's nightmares and it's worshiped by these acronyms. You know, this nightmare dragon who can't be transformed, no polymorph shenanigans, is holding nightmares of the PC's, maybe the souls of loved ones of the PC's. So that's really cool. In a volcano with these acronyms worshiping it. So we've got some minions, we've got a cool setting. It's near the entrance to the underworld. So maybe you can have some undead encounters to take away some of your PC's plethora of abilities before running into this fight. Now, what about a legendary mythic trait? So like the other monsters, when they die, they come back as something different. Well, maybe this time the dragon, when it dies, comes back with floating fire-like elementals around it that the PCs have to hit while combating the dragon. When they hit these, maybe they do 2d6 additional fire damage rather than getting the benefits of cover or something like that, like I would do in the fight with Traumocratus. And this is just gonna make for a really interesting dynamic fight where you've got an escalating situation, upscaling damage against the PCs and this dragon, which stood back up. If you're gonna to choose to deal the PCs damage with these elemental things that are coming out of the ground, if you take this idea, maybe don't bump the dragon all the way up, just round down for its hit points. So they have to deal with just a little bit less. Anyway, that is Mythic Odysseys of Theros. I am very excited about this book, and if you guys have anything else that you want me to cover, be sure to let me know. There will be plenty more content coming. We will be covering the next book as soon as it comes out, Icewind Dale, Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. So excited for that. This video would have come out a little sooner, but I had to wait for my local game store to open so I could go get the book. But I'm so happy that I do have it now. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and follow the applicable links down below in the description. You have all been wonderful. I have been Jake from Monsters and Munchkins, and until I see you again, don't forget to have fun and roll some dice.